Okay. Everyone, welcome to the uh, Munsbar Community Watch meeting. Thanks again to Community Coconino County Public Works and especially Mark Dorraca. And again, as I mentioned before, if anything goes wrong, it's all his fault. The first person tonight will be speaking as usual will be our chief from Munts Park, Josh Tope. Josh, are you there? I am, Lynn. How are you doing? Pretty good, sir. Good. All right. Well, thank you for everyone who's attending. Um, quite a bit going on here at the fire department. Uh, I'm going to start off by letting you guys know that our office manager um, is leaving. She's taken a position with the county schools. Uh, Mindy Moeller will be leaving a, effectively June 1st, starting that new position, but we've replaced her with a uh, gal by the name of Sarah Byram. Um, Sarah's coming to us from actually Dispatch Center, uh, so she will be beginning, she's already kind of started, but officially she starts May 31st. Um, on top of that, we did some uh, reserve testing, so we have reserve firefighters here. They're qualified firefighters that kind of work a part-time gig. Um, we just hired three new firefighters. They're all fairly young individuals. Um, and then we have a couple of events coming up. May 29th, we have a blood drive from 9.30 to 2.30. We've had that posted on our social media. It's also in the paper. Um, and additionally, the Kids Safety Day we have planned for June 26th. Um, that will be actually located. Uh, we're changing that up this year. It'll be located. I apologize for the noise. It'll be located over at the church. Um, there'll be more information in the paper as that gets closer as well. Um, the next thing I wanted to give you, you guys know we had our community cleanups with the uh, Bear Jaw Clue crew completing that. Just wanted to give you guys a little report as far as uh, what was done and the totals. So um, a couple of partnering agencies were uh, involved in this. Uh, APS involved was involved with some grants and, and donation of those clear trash bags we were able to give out. Um, again, Coconino County and the transfer station, mailing of flyers, we appreciate that. Um, Sanitary District also helped with mailing those flyers. And then both Pinewood and our Highlands Fire District had a good part in this. Um, for those that don't know, they completed the cleanup in Pinewood Munns Park, uh, Mountain Air, and Kachina Village this year. It started on April 26th and went through May, May 6th. Uh, they used a total of seven separate vehicles, four trailers, and some chippers. They collected 1,134, uh, they collected from 1,134 individual residents. And they collected over 11,000 trash bags full of debris, 554 cubic yards of slash, 290 material equivalents of uh, roll off dumpsters. Um, and we distributed 12,000 bags. So again, uh, I want to thank our partners with the county and uh, APS and also the sanitary district. The last thing I'll throw out there is a reminder because of that cleanup, uh, people did work on their yards, obviously. Um, go to our website if you would. Uh, it's pinewoodfire.org. And right there on the homepage, if you scroll down just a little bit, there's four buttons at the bottom. One of those says Firewise Reporting. If you click on that, you just add your name, address, phone number, and what kind of work you did. You can put in the number of bags, you can put in the total amount of hours, either one is fine. So we appreciate that. That helps us keep our firewise status here in the community. Uh, if there's nothing else, if anybody has any questions, otherwise that's the end of my report. Thank you, Josh. You betcha. All right, next uh, from the Sheriff's Office, starting out uh, Lieutenant James Stang on the traffic division. James, you there? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. Uh, so yes, I am here. Um, so traffic division, uh, I guess tonight I just uh, wanted to update uh, the community down there. Uh, this Memorial Day, we're going to have extra enforcement for ATV slash UTV or OHV, yeah, ATV. Um, that's going to be in conjunction with the Forest Service and Game and Fish uh, working all over the county. But uh, they're, they're going to concentrate on the uh, Forest Service of 240 in the Munns Park area, which does run down into Pineland Boulevard. Um, so that is something that uh, we're looking in, in that particular area um, as far as traffic. Um, another thing, actually, before I go into that, I want to ask about the, the fire. We are now in fire restrictions, but I know in the past, uh, Munns Park kind of adopts their own um 
ordinance or policy, however the fire department wants to choose there. So, uh, so no, James, we'll always follow county um, as far as fire restrictions go. So as soon as they entered that stage one, we did as well. Okay, I, I just, but I know in the past our ordinance wasn't wasn't good in Munns Park because the fire department kind of handled that in the past year. So I kind of wanted to see, make sure that my guys were on that page. So, you know, see what you guys were. Cause there was that um, a fire district can take over and overrule the, the county ordinance. So I just wanted to see what you guys were doing there. Yeah, we can, but we don't. It's, it's much okay. simpler now that the forest and the county and everybody's doing it at the same time. It, it's just easier if we all do it at the same time. Perfect. All right. So I'll, I'll inform my uh, guys on that and uh, we'll, just, we'll roll with it then. I appreciate it. And then uh, next on the agenda, I wanted to uh, touch on the, uh, the noise complaints that we've been getting uh, in regards to the Bracho Saloon down there. Um, it's come in to us. Uh, quite a few times uh, from different people, um, but there is no noise ordinance in Pocomino County. So because of that, I was asked by an individual to kind of just discuss how it's enforced as far as what, what Pocomino County, the Sheriff's Department can do and will do, is we treat it just as a normal loud, a loud party or a loud music a disturbance, uh, something like that. No different if somebody was having um, a backyard a barbecue with music. Um, because there's no noise ordinance, we have to rely on disorderly conduct. And with disorderly conduct, we go back to uh, the kind of uh, case laws with um, the 10 o'clock at night to 6.30 in the morning is kind of your unwritten quiet hours. Um, obviously, it's not exactly quiet, but something that would be unreasonable. Um, so something the way it was kind of uh, given to me years ago is if someone was working on construction uh, next to your house um, on a, on, let's just say in the middle of the day, you know, they're running air compressors, nail guns, um, backup alarms, you know, you're, you're going to hear that next door. So with the noise or with no noise ordinance, technically that can go till 10 o'clock at night and then start to get at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, what is considered reasonable is determined by a deputy or officer. And the reason they go into that is they talk about, you know, one person's reasonableness might be different from another. One person might want to hear absolutely nothing, but another one might want uh, a loud music or a loud party. So because we deal with this on a, you know, daily basis really in, in different parts of, of the country. That's why they left it up to a reasonable deputy or reasonable officer to make that determination. Um, so uh, that's kind of how we deal with it. Um, so 10 o'clock at night is kind of when we're gonna start enforcing that. And uh, we will make that call uh, depending on the situation at that time. So I just, I don't know if anybody has any questions on that, but I just kind of wanted to yeah, Lieutenant, this is Len again. Uh, yes, I've, I've had a number of people ask, what can we do to lessen the noise from the UTVs or whatever you have to call them, the uh, side by size? Sounds like some of them need a new muffler. Is there any way, is there some something, we don't have a noise ordinance, so is there an acceptable level of noise that each of these units can have? Um, not really. If there's not a decibel and we wouldn't have decibel meters to even record that anyway. Um, so what does it take to get a noise ordinance in Munns Park? Uh, that, that'd be a question for uh, someone else, not myself. Um, we enforce laws, we don't make them. Um, so I would have to give that to somebody else. Uh, I would just, you know, maybe talk to um, uh, planning and zoning maybe to start with, to see what they have to go with. Um, and uh, maybe um, someone else could weigh in on that because I really don't know. I know it would have to go through uh, Board of Supervisor approval, but I don't even know how, how do you start one. Okay, thank you. And I, I know there's a question here. It says, how does that work with uh, restaurants and bands? Um, it, it falls under the same 
uh, since we do not have a noise ordinance that would fall under the same exact guidelines uh, and law that, that we enforce uh, every day with noise ordinance. So if a restaurant or band has it's too loud after 10 o'clock, it could be treated just like a house. So if your next door neighbor had a band that was playing after 10 o'clock or loud music, at 10 o'clock, we would tell them you're done. And if it continued, then they would be cited for the disservice. Okay. All right. Hey, uh, uh, it's Mark here. A uh, quick uh, thing. I see that we have one of our, our uh, attendees with, uh, with the hand up. Just wanted to share that if you uh, have a question, please go ahead and type it into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, that way, not only uh, can we answer it, but we key, uh, the system generates a record of it. So that'd be very helpful. Thank you. And, and uh, if I could, uh, this is Matt Ryan. Uh, Len, uh, Lieutenant Steg is uh, correct. It is an ordinance that would have to be created at community development level, uh, uh, you know, with the Board of Supervisors. Uh, it, it would gradually work, work its way up. Uh, it's uh, noise ordinances are kind of challenging. Uh, uh, first to put in place, then to man up and do enforcement associated with. Uh, thus far, we, we haven't wandered into that realm. It, it is quite difficult to do that, uh, but that's where it would begin. It would start with the board asking community development uh, to implement such a, a an ordinance, and since it's an ordinance, it has to go. Th it would become law, so to speak, uh, at county level. Uh, but um, it would have to go through a different type of hearing process, uh, slightly different than what you see with the typical land hearing process. Well, perhaps we can discuss this offline, Matt, later on. Okay, thank you. Well, Lieutenant, you're going to introduce uh, our new corporal for us? Oh, well, uh, yeah, I guess um, Corporal Luna doesn't need really an introduction down in Munns Park. I believe you guys know him when he was a deputy, but he was recently promoted to a corporal, but he still will remain your uh, community deputy at this time. Um, he's doing a pretty good job with that, I believe, and um, I hope he continues. So uh, without further ado, uh, Corporal Luna, uh, you have um, some stats to give, I believe. You're muted. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you, Andrew. Hey, sorry, sorry. Congratulations so, again, by the way. Oh, thank you. So I'm uh, Corporal Luna with the Sheriff's Office. Um, so obviously with Munns Park, everything that's happening right now, um, we're averaging, there's a deputy in Munns Park at least two to three times on average during their day shift, and then two to three times uh, on night shift. They're averaging being in the park area for about 30 to 40 minutes, uh, patrolling the area. Uh, also, we've increased patrols on the 240 road, obviously with the fire ban. Um, we want to have more of a presence, and we also understand that in my history, I think I'm going on, this will be year three of being the Munns Park Deputy. This upcoming weekend uh, for Memorial Day is usually what starts that summer flow of ATVs, speeders, and everything else. So what we've done at the patrol level um, is all the supervisors at their squads, respectively, um, are going over and doing in-service training, as we call it. Um, to just ensure that a lot of the newer deputies that we have are aware of the OHV laws, are aware of how to enforce those OHV laws, are aware of how to educate the public on those OHV laws. We're also doing the same thing with fire bans to ensure that hopefully we're not getting fires in the woods or we're not getting people that are putting everybody at risk because uh, they're, they're leaving their fires unattended and things like that. Um, so we have deputies that are getting taught on that and how to how to properly enforce those things. Uh, right now, the number one call for service in Munns Park, which is a good thing, is um, it's alarms. Uh, all alarms are checked out so far. Uh, they've all been pretty good. It's just been uh, mechanical issues or 
uh, the Airbnbs and someone didn't know how to turn it off. Someone said it, but didn't know that they said it wrong. So it goes off either way, a deputy responds and we'll head out there. Um, also, I know, how can I saw the, the question about the reasonableness? Um, and I know the LT hit on it, but I'll, I'll also uh, touch on it again, just to ensure where everybody kind of gets it. Um, so the reasonable level is, uh, is based on the officer's uh, discretion. And basically that comes from we're the ones that are out there at all hours of the day. We are the ones that hear all the different noises and can determine um, the difference by knowing the law in terms of what's reasonable, what's unreasonable. Um, I know with the bar, um, we've had deputies that have gone out there and what we're doing now is we're going to the residence of the of whoever the the complainant is we're turning on our body cams we're getting out of our cars and we're kind of listening and we're recording it so that way if it is unreasonable there's evidence that it's unreasonable and then the the deputy or that officer is then going down uh to talk to the general manager and we've also had some conversations with uh security to just kind of let them know you know either hey it's borderline you guys got to turn it down it's unreasonable um, or just to advise them, hey, if there's anything you guys can do, we are getting uh, a number of complaints. Um, then lastly, the only thing I'll, I'll touch on just in case there's anybody who hasn't been here before, I know that there is a Munns Park community page uh, on social media. Uh, we do try to check that, but if there are issues or there is something that is concerning, uh, we are here to serve the community but you, if you please let us know, then we will come on in and we will investigate it. No one wastes our time. We investigate everything. If something seems strange, call it in and let us figure it out. That's that's what we're here for. We're here for you guys. Uh, we enjoy what we do. Um, but I just want it to be 100% sure that you, that everybody understands that you got to just call it in and we'll, and we'll take it from there. Whether it's big, small, and different. Whatever it is, we'll, we'll take care of it for you guys. Unless there's any questions for me, uh, next up. I've, I've uh, got one for you, Andrew. Yes, sir. Uh, this time of the year, as our residents start coming back to the park, they open up their place for the, for the summer, spring and summer, is when we often find that places have been burglarized. Have we had any of that yet? Uh, not, that, not that I'm aware of as of right now. Um, I can check the, I could go back through the records with a fine tooth comb. And if I, if I see anything, I'll let you know. But as of right now, um, I have not been made aware of any uh, late reported burglaries as we would refer to them uh, as of yet. But I, I do know that, that that's what's coming next. Uh, hopefully not. Uh, but I know that that's normally the, the trend for, for a few folks. Right. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, we have, uh, the community programs planner, John Paxton, uh, for the sheriff's office, who has has a put together a ready set go presentation. So, John, you're on. Thanks, Len. Uh, I'm trying to bring that up right now. I don't. Let me see here. Hopefully, I can just bring it up this way. That's not what I wanted. I think my uh, presentation got canceled out here. Hang on, just a second. John, if you would like me to drive, let me know. I will. Hopefully, I'm bringing it up right now. Okay. Is that visible? I don't see anything. Let me go back to here. Share screen. You just oh, there it is, right there. All right. Is it up there? Yes. All right. So, uh, thanks everybody. Uh, good to see a great turnout here tonight. And uh, thanks, Len and Mark, for hosting this. And we've had a lot of questions, uh, as usual, uh, coming up um, as the uh, summer approaches and even the spring as we've seen fires uh, threaten our communities. So we have uh, had questions here over the past month or so. And I think that uh, Chief Tope uh, had brought it to my attention, too, uh, when we were talking about evacuations, um, how we kind of worked that. Uh, in the past, we have had uh, 
you know, we've designed routes of where to go. When I worked in Oak Creek Canyon, we talked about signage and such, and that still plays a role. But overall, what we really wanted to point out to everybody was is that um, in this circumstances, especially in Munns Park, you have one main road coming in and out of there. There is uh, four service roads that lead you uh, over to Mormon Lake or up to, or uh, yeah, north to Mountain Air. But in the event of a fire, um, we always want to try to take the safest route, being something that doesn't travel through the woods. So I'll point that out right now. Um, this is a program that has been started and has been around for, for a couple of years right now and instituted throughout Arizona, and it's called the Ready, Set Pro, Ready, Set, Go program. So what that is, is, is it's kind of simplified it, if you will. We used to have all this jargon in the past, but right now what we want to do is we want to um, put it in the three steps, if you will. So the ready, the ready part of this, and we've had questions of this um, during some major fires, you know, when do we go to ready? Well, you should always be in the ready, okay? So what we're doing here is, is we, we are we're encouraging residents um, and if you will guess, but let's just talk about property owners at best to take some proactive measures to begin with to make sure that you're ready for this emergency. And I think we can all agree that the primary emergency that we face here in Northern Arizona, especially in Flagstaff, is fire. That's what we see year in and year out. So we just there we started this program um, or this this program was started just to take some some general actions uh, and some preparedness to help yourself in the community when you're threatened. So ready, right? And, and uh, Chief Tope was just talking about this. This kind of incorporates the firewise. For your home, uh, be aware of the hazards that threaten your community. And the, as we just said, we're talking about fire primarily. There are other hazards, but this is the one that really threatens us, you know, a high percentage of the time. Be aware of, that, be aware of these hazards, okay? Create this defensible space around your house by clearing 30 to 100 feet of vegetation to protect it from fire. Um, I'm sure everybody here is aware of it and uh, all the first responders will tell you from what they've seen from fire to fire uh, is that people that prepared their homes, when you see a neighborhood that's been devastated by a fire, you will see a house that's fine, one that's burnt, one that's fine, burnt, burnt, fine, fine. Um, a lot of that is due to the preparedness that homeowner took because it is, it is the wind uh, that blows, right? How the fire jumps. It blows those embers. And if there is something around your house, let's just say a, a fistful of pine needles that's in the corner of your house that you haven't cleaned out, and that ember is just fortunate enough to land there, that's where it's going to start a fire in those dry pine needles and unfortunately start to work itself up in a portion of your house. So walk around your house, check this, mow your grass, clear debris, trim your trees. Um, you know, this is the best thing you can do to try to protect yourself, whether you're there or having to evacuate, okay? Build an emergency go kit with enough food, water, and emergency supplies for 72 hours. We talk about this extensively in our CERT class that we train. What are the things you need in a go kit? Can you be sustainable for 24 to 48 to 72 hours? If you have to leave your house right now, get up and walk away. Are you prepared to do that? I stress that because evacuation is a stressful time. And if you haven't prepared for it and you're lingering around and you see these videos of backed up cars forever, okay? I'm gonna to touch base about this in the, in the, in the set portion. If, you're, if you see these videos, that's because these people weren't ready to go or they denied the fact that a threat was coming or they weren't prepared for that threat to come, okay? So get that emergency kit ready to go. Have your house prepared. Okay, and then write a family communication and evacuation plan. We talk about this, but if you don't have your phone, and I, and I, I stress this in my classes too, do you know the, the, the phone number of your loved one? I know my phone number of my mom is mom, okay? And my husband, and my, husband, my wife as, as Cynthia. Um, I've, I had to actually go back and learn these numbers. If you didn't have that resource with you, could you call them from say your office phone without having it created on your on your, on, your, on your cell phone. Write these things down, have them ready. Can your kids remember this? Can your loved ones remember these numbers? Make sure that you have that communication plan uh, written out. Uh, don't assume that their phone is gonna be working or that they'll know your number 
without having their cell phone with them. We become very reliant on that. Here is the set, okay? Now this is the set stage. This is, uh, there's a fire in Flagstaff. There's a fire at Rocky Park Road, okay? Now it is past a trigger point. And I will let, I will let uh, Chief Tope talk about that more or the Forest Service talk about that more. But they set these trigger points that we start our evacuations at. We work with the local fire department and the Forest Service to do these kind of things. We don't just arbitrarily assume, okay, hey, it's time to evacuate. We're all working in conjunction. So know when there is a significant danger in your area. And this comes through having uh, emergency notifications, which I will let uh, the emergency manager, uh, uh, Wes uh, Dyson, touch base on. Uh, you need to be on this notification. This is the best way for you to be notified. If you're relying on your neighbors or the emergency alert coming across the bottom of the TV, that's wonderful. But this emergency notification will come quicker than any one of those. And this gets you in the set. This makes you aware a threat is coming. You need to be ready to evacuate, okay? Um, and then just like I said, stay aware of the latest news and the information from the public safety officials. If there's a threat in the area, uh, hopefully there's enough time for us to be in the area for you to call people. There will be a call center set up also by emergency management. And the, the numbers will be broadcast through this emergency notification where you can call and get the latest updates and know what it is. Go time. This is when we are gonna let you know, we will have people driving around, the fire department, forest service, sheriff's office, DPS, CERT members, okay? Search and rescue, we're gonna be knocking on doors, okay? This is when we're gonna be telling you, it's time to go. It's coming and the immediate threat to life and property is imminent. It's, you know, there's no more waiting around, there's no more planning. That's, that's the basis of this program is to be prepared. Start taking steps to prepare yourself and your family for this emergency, okay? Follow instructions from emergency personnel, meaning when you leave your residence, we're gonna be giving directions on which way to go. In Munns Park, we're gonna be directing you, more than likely, we're gonna be directing you towards the freeway. So pay attention, don't deviate from that. Stay on the safest path that we give you. All right, so that is the program. I mean, it's, it's kind of down and dirty. Um, and it puts a lot on you to be prepared and ready to go. Um, the go kit, okay, that we talked about. There's so many other things besides putting, you know, your MREs and your, uh, and your water jugs in your bag. There's things you need to be thinking about. Um, and as I stressed, be self-sufficient for 72 hours. Consider, the, consider what is important, the unique needs of your family, uh, your children, your seniors, and your pets, medication, um, uh, uh, bedding, pillows, sleeping bags, food, water, obviously, um, medical kits for yourself, um, important documents and papers. We have this amazing thing called a, a flash drive, right? Or a thumb drive, however you want to call it. You can put a lot of stuff on that. Uh, and, and important things, passports, driver's license pictures, pictures that you don't want to lose in case something does tragically happen to your house. But take the time and do it. I tell the classes when I teach them, I don't expect you to sit down for the next you know, 72 hours straight to put this stuff on a flash drive, but start sitting down right now and putting those important papers either in a box that you can take them away in or on a flash drive that you have in that bag and keep updating it, okay? Check this kit every six months, okay? Um, uh, believe it or not, we have water that sits in bags and it's, it's called emergency water. Sometimes a lot of people would see this in like a, a rescue raft off of a major ship or something, but check your supplies and make sure they're good. Primarily think about light, batteries, and such. Things that have an expiration date. Uh, as long as food lasts, it doesn't last forever, except for spam. I got lots of spam. So make sure you're checking these things to, 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 that, you're, that, that you're comfortable with when you go that you're good for, for 72 hours. Uh, if you go to a shelter, let's say the Red Cross has set up a shelter, they will try to have as many cots or mattresses as possible. They cannot guarantee you sheets, comforters, and pillows. Bring something. Have something ready to go when you're ready to go. And these are just recommendations that I was just talking about that I was trying to cover with everybody, right? Uh, Non-perishable food, prescription medication, and some eyeglasses. I have to wear reading glasses. 
Uh, when I turned 40 and I was on the road, I thought all driver's licenses were going bad. Just turned out it was my eyes. Okay. And I had to get reading glasses. So I make sure I have reading glasses all over the house. I have them in the, in my office, in the car, I have them everywhere. Put something in there, personal hygiene, toothpaste, you know, have a little kit. We take it when we go to the hotel, take it when you have something ready for that, that stuff will last a long time and you can just keep it in a bag cash. Why cash? Well, I can tell you because cash can be a very valuable commodity when they have to shut the power down because the smoke or the fire is approaching uh, major power lines. And that's what they do. It creates, I, I, I can't get into that jargon. All I know is, is they shut stuff down when it's close to that. You may not have a chance to stop an ATM or get an ATM. Um, wherever you stop to buy something, that power may be shut down and your credit card or debit card is not going to work. Have some cash in there. Okay. Once again, the family communication plan and evacuation plan. Where are you going? Not just the road that you're going, but where are you going to end up? Because we can't plan every emergency by us being all, our whole family being at home. You are, chances are you are going to be separated. Let your loved ones know in case of an emergency, where are we going to go? Water. Can't stress that enough. Water's heavy, but a water purifier is also pretty light and pretty good. But it's not bad just to have a gallon of water in there or something, you know, or, or a container of water. Okay, battery powered uh, radio or uh, a flashlight. They're, those are great ideas. Don't have to worry about batteries. You know, they don't last as long, but they can get you through some tough times if all, by all you have to do is crank them up. A manual can opener, I think that goes without saying, right? I think we take a lot of things for granted, but uh, the manual can opener can, can become very valuable uh, during a time of need. Uh, first aid kit, uh, along with whatever you need in there, along with the prescription medications, like I was just saying. Make sure you have a little stash in there that can get you through uh, a few days or a week. Cell phone with your charger. Take that charger. We've all been there where we're like, oh shoot, I don't have my charger and nobody else has it. And have a wall part, uh, you know, like a 110 charger in there. Okay. Um, clothing. Have a change of clothing. You're going somewhere for three days. In your mind, have an extra shirt, pair of jeans, some, you know, some underwear. Just, just pack a bag. Have that ready to go. Put these basic necessities in there so that you're prepared. So like I said, this is kind of a down and dirty thing. It's going to come at you pretty fast when it happens. I don't think anybody really realizes it. So I can't stress enough to be, uh, uh, be registered with emergency notifications so that you give yourself the biggest chance or the best chance to be notified to take action. John, you, you just touched on that uh, at the end here about uh, registering your phone numbers, your email addresses. The Pinewood News, I believe, carries that every issue, but uh, you won't get any notification if you don't register your phone numbers and your cell phones or your email addresses. I can't do it for you. You have to do it yourself. Yeah, you, you, you hit that on the head, Len. Uh, this is, you know, like I said, I, I want to let West touch base on this. This is this is emergency management or emergency management's uh, uh, thing. Um, but go on there, check it. If you've already registered, go back and make sure that all your information is current. There's glitches all the time. Go in there, and make sure your stuff is current, and that you you are getting these notifications. There is one question here um, from Joy. Thank you, Joy. Uh, communication key. No one interviewed in my neighborhood had any do any clue that Forest Road uh, that that force road exists, not an option. How do we endure all of our community when all we can do, when where we can and cannot go and what alternatives we have uh, by location of parks? So, um, you know, I'll answer that in the fact that, yeah, you, you, you have moved in, you, you live in a community that has some limited access points. That's just, that's the way that it, you know, that's the way that it is. Um, I'm not saying don't exit through a four service road. My point to that is, is that you want to go through an, a four service road and then suddenly you're halfway through it and somebody's had a wreck because they were in a hurry. They picked up their phone trying to call a loved one. Um, you know, you want to try to always take the safest route out. Okay, John. Thank you. Um, you Next, uh, we have from the Coconino National Forest, uh, Andrew Hostad. Andrew, thank you for coming in. And how, what are our trees telling you, by the way? You may be on mute, Andrew. I 
Are you there, Andrew? Yeah, no, that's John again. Andrew Hostad, are you there? I, I think don't I'm see off. him on here anymore, Len. I just saw his picture a second ago. Well, let's jump. Uh, we'll jump over then. Let's go to our weather service. Brian Lomowski, I know you're on there. What's what's the weather going to do to us, Brian? All right. Hey, Len. Um, thank you very much. Uh, you know, what we see is what we're going to get right now. We're in a pretty active pattern where we're seeing a lot of these dry, windy systems pass through. Uh, we have a very vigorous system, which is going to be just off to our west here over the weekend, which is going to have several days of windy, dry conditions uh, through this weekend. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, um, the fire season is here and it's going to be here for a while. I know there's still some parts of the forest up here, which, uh, you know, has some, um, has a little bit of green to the understory still, but uh, we expect things to rapidly dry out um, as we continue through May and then into our traditional uh very dry and warm Junes. Um, as we all know, we've had a very dry winter. Um, dry uh, if we start from, let's say, uh, October or so. Um, you know, uh, in the Southwest, we're anywhere from 30 to uh, around 30 to 40 percent uh, below normal precipitation. Starting in January, however, um, we're about normal since January 1, which is great. You know, we really appreciated a lot of those storms that we had. Um, since January, which actually brought our snowfall to near normal this year, uh, which might um, have a little people by surprise. But what's the outlook uh, for this fire season and the rest um, and the monsoon? You know, I can chat uh, a little bit about that. Um, the active pattern, active dry, windy pattern, which we've seen is pretty much going to continue over the next couple of weeks. It's not that unusual. Um, to see these windy conditions continue well into June, and it looks like that's going to happen. But um, uh, the monsoon currently is on track, and it's on track to be, at least according to the Climate Prediction Center and other experts that I've talking to, that maybe we're going to lean toward an outlook of above normal precipitation for this monsoon. That's great news after the past two horrendous monsoons or non-soons that we've had. Um, people would call them. Um, um, what we're seeing is a combination of a couple factors. Uh, first of which is a pretty well-known correlation between dry winters and wetter monsoons. Um, there is a slight correlation there and the inverse is also correlated. That is wet winters correlating with drier monsoons. Um, it goes both ways and with the dry winter that we've had over much of the Southwest, essentially what that is gonna allow the atmosphere and the surface of the earth to do is to dry out faster and heat up faster. Um, looking, you know, middle and late June, looks like it's likely gonna be very, very warm. But what that does is it tends to create that monsoon circulation for us. The hot, warm days of mid to late June creates the low pressure we need to bring that moisture up from the south. And everything looks to be on track for that to happen this year. Um, I've had a couple questions about, hey, you know, we've had two very dry monsoons. Is this the new normal? Is this a new trend? And indeed it is not. Um, if you look at the long-term trends, let's say from about 1950 or so, to the present, even with the very dry monsoons we had in 2019 and 2020, we're still trending toward wetter monsoons each year. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, so uh, the official outlook is for is leaning toward a wetter than normal monsoon. I wouldn't be surprised, given the patterns we're seeing right now, that it might kick in a bit early too. Um, but of course, you know, that transition between fire season in late June and the monsoon season um, in early July is always one which can be very hazardous. Um, if we have a lot of storms but not much precipitation, then we frequently see a lot of lightning starts out in the forest uh, for fires. It can be very dangerous. We just have to get that moisture up here as soon as we can, some good wet thunderstorms, and wet things down. 
Looking out a little bit farther past the monsoon, I just looked at the latest outlooks uh, for the fall. And right now, there's really no signals to indicate drier or wetter than normal. So right now, we're going for normal. Um, we don't see that much of a signal uh, for any um, El Nino or, or La Nina right now. For next winter, uh, we'll still have to wait and see. But we'll keep our fingers crossed that uh, next winter will deliver. So. Uh, I'll go ahead and stop there and see if there's any questions. I guess not. Thank you, Brian, for that com uh, kind of very complete uh, report. Let's keep our fingers crossed for water, right? All right, we have, uh, uh, somehow we lost Andrew Hostad, but he's back. So from the Coconino National Forest. Andrew, you still there? Yep, I'm here. Uh, you guys hear me all right? Yep, I can hear you. Oh. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I don't know, must have been sudden link. Uh, always seem to have problems with them. So, but uh, I'm back now and hopefully it stays that way. So uh, yeah, I want to talk about uh, activities on the forest uh, on or, you know, relatively near you. Uh, first off, I wanted to, you know, start talking about the, some RX or prescribed burn success we had this, this spring. Um, on the Flagstaff Ranger District, we were able to uh, pull off a, a couple burns in the very short weather window that we uh, had. Um, the first ones were uh, north of the actual San Francisco peaks. Um, chances are you probably didn't even see it uh, unless you uh, can heard about it on, on the news or that sort of thing. It was just shy of about a thousand acres on the north side of the peaks there. Um, but then the other one uh, that we were able to do was uh, the naval uh, prescribed burn, uh, which was just about a week ago. Uh, over there on the southwest side of Flagstaff, um, the naval uh, sandwiched between the naval observatory and uh, the Westwood uh, subdivision Flagstaff ranches. Uh, that one was only about 135 acres, but it was really strate strategic in, and will go a long ways in protecting, uh, you know, some of the vital infrastructure and uh, private property uh, lives and, and that sort of thing, kind of on the southwest side of uh, Flagstaff or Western Edge. Um, and, you know, and I think towards the future, we are going to be really trying to uh, target, you know, strategically uh, acres around what we call the WUI or Wildland Urban Interface. Um, you know, Munns Park uh, over the past five years had had, uh, you know, several burns uh, right on the outskirts and that's done a lot to help protect uh, the neighborhood or the, the community there um, and we're, we're going to be focusing on, on lands right around the Wooey uh, areas. Uh, the one thing with that is because it's proximity to uh, those values at risk and, and everything, um, they're a lot more labor intensive, require way more resources uh, just to ensure that the, you know, the fire, the prescribed burn stays where we want it to and, and that sort of thing as well as just informational, um, you know, we had seven folks uh, basically scattered around the burn, um, that Naval Observatory burn, just basically doing public information and, you know, ensuring the communities that, uh, you know, yes, this was a planned event and, uh, you know, we're on top of it um, and, and really, you know, that, we had six times the required amount of resources uh, based on, on all our um, models and, and everything just to ensure that um, things, things went right. And uh, so rather than trying to get acres way out uh, that are usually kind of easier acres uh, way out away from places, we're gonna be focusing on uh, you know those wooey uh, burns and, and stuff coming up in the future. And uh, another one that you might have seen, which was down on the Mogollon Rim and Red Rock Ranger districts, uh, they completed uh, several uh, burns on different days of the 
upper Beaver Creek uh, prescribed fire. I think they still have more units to do, um, but that was, you, you probably saw some big columns coming up. Uh, it was centered around the Stoneman Lake area, kind of between sandwiched between I-17 and uh, Lake Mary Road and, and that sort of thing. But uh, so everybody knows the forest is done uh, with prescribed fire season for, for now. Um, the conditions definitely have to uh, uh, lessen before we would pick that back up uh, this fall and, and that sort of thing. So prescribed fire is, is done with now. So if you see a smoke column coming up, uh, you know, definitely call that in and, and everything. So, um, you know, Brian, I, I, I definitely don't like stealing uh, from Brian's uh, presentation and everything, but the fire season outlook is, is uh, definitely looking uh, to be above normal uh, activity until we get the relief from those monsoons. And I'm really glad that uh, he's saying that they're still tracking to come in uh, and everything. Um, based on the conditions, we're expecting elevated fire danger and significant wildfire potential uh, for the rest of May and, and, and June. Uh, so that's, it's great that John uh, covered, um, covered the Ready, Set, Go program. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that we've talked about tonight uh, has all been uh, talking about fire and everything. As, as people discussed earlier, uh, we're currently in stage one fire restrictions, uh, very high fire danger uh, across the district. Um, and, you know, they haven't set a date, but more than likely by next Friday, right before Memorial Day weekend, we'll be going into stage two. Uh, again, has not been fully determined, at least uh, that I've been made aware, but um, we're looking at ratcheting up to stage two, which would mean that even in the developed campgrounds uh, and recreational areas, they won't be allowed to have open uh, wood or charcoal uh, type burning. Um, the only things that would be allowed would be the propane uh, with the on off switch pressurized, um, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, there, there's still been talk about potentially if, if conditions continue, we've got a, a ways still until, um, until the relief of the monsoons. We could very well go into what we did in, in 2018, if people remember, uh, partial area closures. And for the Flagstaff Ranger District, uh, we would do kind of the same closure areas. And that's based on uh, just, you know, proximity to, uh, you know, some significant values at risk and uh, terrain and, and topography and everything that, um, and fuel conditions that would really make it hard to fight fire in. So that would be, uh, you know, most people are familiar with the, the ones from two, 2018, but uh, again, it's peaks kind of sandwiched between 180 and Highway 89 North, like you're headed to Page there and kind of a, a, a bubble around the peaks, uh, the Walnut Canyon area, um, the Kelly Canyon pump house wash area and then uh, Mormon Mountain. And so, um, you know, Mormon Mountain being, uh, you know, the north side of that drains into uh, Lake Mary, which is, you know, Flagstaff watershed protection and, and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, uh, so basically recap on that. Currently in stage one restrictions, we entered those last Friday. Uh, looking to ratchet it up to um, the, the next uh, stage uh, pretty soon. Uh, I believe that will be Friday the, the 28th, right before uh, Memorial Day weekend. Uh, but we should have that information. And we'll, we don't just do it, as uh, Chief Tope said, uh, we don't do it just by ourselves. Uh, it's, you know, with the county uh, Kaibab and, uh, other, uh, agencies and, and everything. So, um, we'll, we'll keep that as standard across the agencies as possible. And then lastly, I just wanted to update you guys on, uh, some of the timber projects around Munns Park area. 
Uh, so the Munns Park Timber Sale, uh, that's the one that is mainly mainly been across uh, on the west side of 17 there. Uh, that has 128 acres left uh, to be treated. The purchaser is expected to finish before the end of this year. Uh, so expect logging operations this coming fall, but could start uh, as soon as they want provided uh, we don't, you know, and they have to follow the industrial fire safety plans that change um, based on what, what our fire conditions are and, and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, potentially they may be having to work at, between certain hours of the day or, um, you know, just taking other precautions and, and that sort of thing. Um, basically what they have left to do is cutting units four and five. And those are uh, basically, again, on the, the west side of uh, the interstate behind kind of the, the RV park and uh, the, the stuff over there, that direction. Um, the other, the other uh, timber sale that I wanted to talk to you guys about is there's the for, frog tank uh, forest thinning uh, project north and, and both north and east of uh, Munns Park. It's about 2,800 acres slated for thinning. Um, the objectives of that is again, just like all that we've been talking about so far, reduce the risk of catastrophic crown fire within the urban interface area around Munns Park, um, while creating conditions conducive to the reintroduction of low intensity surface fire, uh, because the forest needs fire to stay healthy. It just, we don't want it racing through the crowns. It should be creeping along the ground and cleaning up the forest floor. Uh, it will also improve the forest health by reducing the tree densities, uh, thus enhancing individual tree growth and vigor and, and that sort of thing, uh, and trying to maintain uh, diversity in, in the size classes and ages of the trees, uh, prioritizing the largest and oldest trees. Um, timelines for, for that, uh, basically, uh, kind of, you're going to start seeing a bunch of paint showing up on uh, some of the trees and let me uh, let me just start showing. So when you start seeing this uh, orange like the orange bands showing up on the, the trees with uh, the orange dot down there at the bottom, um, that's that's gonna be uh, the contractors coming through and starting marking the units. Um, let me show you a map for um, this sale. Okay, did that uh, did that map come up? Not yet. Okay, let me go back in here. Okay. Yeah, there we go. So as you can see, it's it's mostly um, north. Here's like the rest area off of 17. So there's units over here, uh, and then to the east east side of uh, or kind of northeast side of Munns Park. Uh, the green line here is the 700 road. If you're uh, folks are familiar with where that comes in. Um, here's down here is the 240 and those eventually meet up over there. But, uh, you know, these units are slated for uh, thinning. Um, and then, so the contracts, they're ho hoping to be offered either late, later this fall or uh, by next spring. And, uh, but, you know, keep in mind that could be delayed, you know, with all the, different things going on, but uh, they're shooting for either later this fall or early uh, next spring, uh, which means that the once the timber contract is awarded, cutting uh, takes place across the project area, um, kind of between 2022 uh, to 2025. So 
it could be as early as next year that um, they're starting to to thin in the, these areas. Um, and uh, but they had the contract actually runs till uh, sometime in 2025. So um, the, that'll be done there. And then um, late 2020s to early 2030s, which will be here faster than than folks think, uh, will be after after these areas are treated mechanically uh, by thinning. Uh, we're going to follow up with prescribed burning, um, and by that time. Uh, the areas that we had previously burned on the south side of kind of the south and uh, southeast side of Munns Park, those will probably be ready for another re-entry uh, with prescribed fire and that sort of thing. So you'll see, you know, just the bubble around uh, Munns Park getting even more uh, reinforced and, and everything to help uh, prevent those catastrophic wildfires from impacting the communities. But, you know, even with all that, uh, we still need everybody's help. And that's where uh, all the all the work that uh, you guys did with Bear Jaw and the Ready, Set, Go, um, we still need everybody's help. So, uh, Great, and you know, I, I got a real quick question for you, though, before we jump to the next presenter. Yep. Um, as you know, I've been in Munns Park for a long time. I think I've seen more dead trees this year, uh, both in the park and on my way to Flagstaff. Uh, are we seeing a potential of bark beetles perhaps on these dead trees? Uh, there's always a potential. Um, you know, the more, trees are like people in that they can compensate for only so long. So their systems have been compensating for the two years of the non-monsoons um, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, you, you may have heard about the juniper, juniper across uh, large sections of Northern Arizona um, kind of dying off and, and that sort of thing. We haven't seen the Ponderosa nearly as impacted. However, you know, they are, definitely drought stressed and um, will, you know, there is, whenever they're more stressed, they have a harder time fighting off everything from uh, beetles to, uh, cat, you know, wildfire and, and that sort of thing. Um, right. A healthy non-stressed tree will resist uh, fire much better than one that's you know very sick and drought stressed if that well, makes thank, sense thank you so much andrew uh yep. we're, gonna, we're gonna go now to the coconut county public works and mark hey. i'll let you hey lynn can i uh hop in this is chief tope real quick you got quite a few questions here um i'm gonna hit a few of them real quick if i can please uh please. somebody asked if pinewood fire is still doing property inspections for firewise and yes i meant to hit that after john paxton got off well, just give a call down to the station here at 928-286-9885. Uh, let us know that you want a firewise inspection and we'll get that scheduled for you. Um, let's see what else we have. One of the other questions is when will the burns behind the Chevron happen? There are many fallen and dead trees grouped together. Uh, I assume they're talking about back behind the RV park. That's what uh, Andrew alluded to as far as it's gonna be machine thinned. Um, so the burns aren't going to happen for years. First, they need to thin, then they get possible pile burns, and then they go in with a broadcast burn. So that's a, a years long process. Um, and then you asked, what does four and five mean? I believe that's referring to those two lots of timber sales. Those are just what the lots are numbered um, back behind uh, the RV park there. Um, there's also, what is the chance of going into stage three? Basically, we have stage one, we have stage two, and then we go into closures. They can be partial closures or complete closures. Uh, so there really is no stage three. Um, stage two, most likely, uh, as Andrew said, most likely is gonna happen that Friday before Memorial Day. Um, the rest of the questions, somebody else is gonna have to take for me. Thanks, okay, guys. yeah, I just put a map up. Uh, units four and five are are here. Here's four, 
and here's five. And those, as you can see, if this is I-17 coming through uh, the park, um, they're kind of lining up there on that southwest side. Hopefully that answered uh, that question about four and five. What about the logging truck question? Did you see that? Um, let me see. Will the logging trucks be using Munks Park uh, roads? That I do not know. I will have to uh, talk with the timber folks and find out what their, uh, their hauling plan is. I believe it'll probably be... Um, if they do, they'll probably be coming... Well, actually, I think they'll be probably taking the 253 up to Willard, uh, but there is a, a, a potential for um, them to maybe come down that road, that frontage road there. Uh, but yeah, Munns Ranch Road. Yeah, I will. I will uh, check on that with uh, the timber folks and, and get back to you. Right. Good. Um, You'll have that answer maybe a little better in three months when we do our next our next presentation, right? I'm sorry, Len. I said maybe you'll have information for our next meeting. Uh, okay. In yeah. Otherwise, I can also email somebody uh, specifically and and that sort of thing too. Okay. All right, uh, Mark Larocca, you're on. All right. Well, thanks, Len. Uh, thanks, everybody. Good to be here. Uh, I'm going to be really quick and just say that uh, uh, one of the uh, victims of COVID, of course, has been the fact that we haven't been able to meet in person. And over the last year or so, we've had a lot of changes at Public Works. A lot of you will remember Mike Lopker was our deputy director uh, for about a decade up until the end of 2019. Shortly thereafter, we got a new deputy director uh, and he is on with us tonight. His name is Esler Musta. And Esler is a county grown product. I believe he started as a finance professional. He's been a project lead on several really in-depth projects. Very, very bright guy. And uh, right now he is serving as our interim director here at Public Works. Um, of course, we all know Lucinda who uh, always wears at least two hats. So she's been director of public works for quite a while, uh, a decade, or pardon me, about five years. And uh, she's also been deputy county manager for the better part of, uh, I think, three years. Uh, because we have a new county manager, she is working exclusively with him. His name is Steve Peru. So in the interim, uh, we do have Esler, who's going to be serving uh, a hitch as our uh, director. So he's currently our interim director. So without further ado, uh, here's Esler Mustak. And I hope I, I, spent, I said your name correctly, Esler. I'm never sure. <laughs> thank you, Mark. And thank you for having me. Uh, uh, it's good to be with everybody. Uh, those, If I had known that uh, Mark was going to do the introduction, I would have worn a jacket at the, at the meeting uh, too. But uh, a couple of quick updates I wanted to share with everybody that uh, here at Public Works, you see that Mark and I share the same background because we are celebrating with our with our Public Works team and the community that we serve uh, our Public Works week. So this whole week of uh, May 17th through the 21st is Public Works week. So that's a, and that's a celebration for, for us as uh, Public Works professionals. Uh, at the at the county and uh, across the across the nation, uh, we a, a quick update is the Willard Springs community cleanup days you, uh, at the in the city of Flagstaff landfill. Uh, uh, bulk pickup waste pickup uh, is uh, you should have gotten all the vouchers in the mail. Uh, the vouchers were delivered at the beginning of the were mailed at the uh, with the Pinewood Sanitary District at the beginning of the month. Uh, for uh, including the, the, the information on uh, what's allowed and, and, and how that all works. Uh, owners, property owners in Munns Park that are not part and don't get a billing from the sanitary district got their uh, voucher materials from the uh, county assessor's address that's on file on the record for their property. So hopefully uh, that should be taken care of the majority of the 
of the vouchers. And if there are people that don't have that information or haven't received anything yet in the mail, they should reach out at our uh, Coquitino County main phone line, which is 928-679-8300 uh, to make sure that we can get you the, the right information and the, and the voucher. Uh, the 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 next thing I want to uh, talk about, and, and Chief Pope uh, mentioned this, but we are uh, very excited and and uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, see the, the the benefit of the of the third year of the Bear Drop uh, Green Waste uh, Community Cleanup. Like that was a, a phenomenal effort this this year, uh, and uh, and it's it's showing the need for the green waste. Uh, Disposal uh, options in in the in the Munsport community in Kitchen and Mountaineer. So we're happy to be partners with you on on that. Uh, I wanted to touch base on uh, one thing that is not probably not the the sexiest of things to talk about, but it's a the transfer station and the solid waste business at Willard Springs. Um, just as a, a little bit of background, I think we've engaged with different members in, in the community. And, and a lot of you know the history behind the Willard Spring Transfer Station. We've, uh, uh, since 2015, we've had like different informal groups that have talked and, 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 and engaged in this process and we've increased the rates. We've structured the hours of the, uh, of the operation for the, the solid waste uh, transfer station with the goal of breaking even and not uh, not uh, uh, and breaking even financially, uh, and we are finding it harder and harder to compete with the private sector haulers. And uh, the county has uh, closed most of uh, has closed all actually the all the transfer station with the exception of the Willard Springs one because we cannot compete in terms of cost and and uh, and uh, convenience with the private sector and. Uh, and by, by statute, the county is a provider of the last resource for um, solid waste. And we're facing some uh, pretty significant head headwinds with the, with the solid waste operation. Uh, uh, throughout the years, we've uh, seen a decrease in the number of, of, of users uh, for a transfer station. Uh, and uh, we uh, definitely have some um, uh, capital needs and reinvestments that we need to, to do in order to keep that operation up and running uh, with our aging equipment and, and hauling bins. Uh, we also want to, again, like I mentioned earlier, that we want to provide the, the services that are the most in demand. And right now, the community cleanups, we want to continue the bulk, bulk uh, voucher program with the community cleanup uh, in, in this year and in future years. And then we see that uh, there is a tremendous need, uh, and uh, and uh, and from the from the community in the green waste. Uh, the high demand from green waste disposal has direct benefits to some of the, the presentations that m uh, many of the other uh, folks here from the Forest Service and and the fire um, the, uh, the, the fire department mentioned that uh, it reduces the fire dangers in the community and. Uh, and we feel like the, the, we've run our course with the, the solid waste operation and, um, and we are uh, slowly uh, coming to that same conclusion that we need to reinvest and kind of pivot towards the future. And that is uh, having a, an effective, repurposing the solid waste footprint and having an effective uh, solid green waste, something, having an effective green waste uh, option for the community. That has the better that, that has the better impact and it's a better investment moving forward. So, with that, um, that kind of concludes like the couple of dates that I wanted to share with Public Works. And I know uh, there are a few folks here that have been part of these conversations that can maybe provide you a little bit of background if uh, if needed on uh, on our previous efforts. Any questions from anybody? Scott Bowen, I know you're out there. You have any questions? No. Okay, is that it, Esler? That is it. Well, thank you very much. Nice, nice to meet you in, in person, sort of like. <laughs> Next, uh, 
from the emergency management uh, people, uh, director is Wes Dyson. Uh, Wes, are you there? I am, Len. Good evening. How are you, sir? Pretty good. How about you? Doing well. Thank you for your time tonight. Uh, I'll be pretty quick with just some updates. Um, first of all, I wanted to start with the vaccine site that took place at the Country Club there in Munns Park this afternoon. We were there from two to six, and I believe our final count was 18 of your neighbors showed up and were vaccinated. So that's a, that's a good number. Um, we will be continuing these mobile pop-up vaccination events uh, moving forward. Most of you probably know, we actually shut down the Fort Tut Hill vaccination site yesterday. That site is no longer functioning. Uh, and the county is going to transition into pop-up events like we had today there at the Country Club in Men's Park. We'll be going all over the county to service far and wide across the entire county. Um, I had a, an opportunity to have a nice conversation with, um, with uh, Chief Tope. We also provided him with some more ready, set, go uh, flyers that he asked for. We happened to have some with us, so that worked really well. Um, I personally very, very much value our relationships that we have across the county. Um, all of our fire chiefs and our fire district chiefs are all uh, really key pieces of that. So it was good to visit with Josh for a little while. Uh, on the vaccines, just one last point there. The NAU um, vaccine pod point of distribution is still open. Uh, it is scheduled at this point. Last I understood, it's through the end of June. So if you need your first or your second dose, um, it's still available there. Or you can hit one of our pop-up sites. We will be advertising those very heavily through public affairs, uh, social media, et cetera. Uh, you also now have pretty much availability of Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J &J in the county at different venues and different locations. So if you have a particular reason to choose, um, that is now available. So... Uh, it was a good event out there today. Really, really nice setting and, and a good event. Um, second, you know, the conversation here today has been very heavy on fire. Of course, that's all in all of our minds right now. That is our, our primary concern these days. Um, I'd like to make sure that all of your residents know and understand that, that the county's ready. Uh, the Emergency Operations Center or the Health Emergency Operations Center as we are currently operating. Uh, has recently done a very significant infrastructure update with uh, communications capabilities, uh, the, the, the TVs and the monitors necessary to utilize GIS information, to share information, um, a, lot of, a lot of upgrades and changes. So we are ready. We, we are definitely ready. Hopefully we don't need it, uh, but we are ready. We're working on staffing for that facility. Um, for, for any kind of large deployment like that, we have to reach kind of far and wide to find enough staffing. We're very fortunate here in Cook and New York County. We have great partnerships across the county departments, over to the sheriff's department, to everybody. Uh, we have got a significant roster uh, formed of people that are ready, trained, and capable to support us in the response support and coordination function of the EOC. Uh, we've also, uh, we're currently in the process of bringing an intern in for the summer. Uh, she's been with us before, extremely capable, uh, very smart young lady. And we have also hired um, a temp employee, very well known to the region. His name's Bob Oral. Many, many people may know Bob. Uh, he's retired from Flagstaff Fire and he's very, very good at incident command and EOC operations and things of that nature. So Bob is currently helping us develop a preseason, if you will. It'll be coming up in the next couple of weeks, uh, an exercise, just to make sure that everybody is, you know, dialed in correctly. And Bob's helping us build that right now. Very what good, are, Wes. Um, I, will, I will make sure that the Pinewood News always carries, and I'm sure uh, Chief Tope would help me on this, always carries how you sign up for Ready, Set, Go. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about that here shortly. Then. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Um, last couple of things. Uh, we just today submitted to FEMA the County Multi Jurisdictional Hazard Mitigation Plan. It's a long title. You don't need to worry about memorizing that. But 
that is the mechanism that allows us to apply, apply for mitigation funding for projects, um, forest recovery projects, uh, flooding control projects, that kind of thing. The plan has been in development since uh, September. It's a long process and we submitted it today uh, to FEMA, which is a good thing. Uh, this plan allows us to apply for federal funding to address natural hazards natural hazards. It doesn't address pandemics, for example. It doesn't address train wrecks. It addresses natural hazards. The plan itself is not a funding mechanism, but it is required for us to apply for funding. So really, really important. Um, I do want to talk about Ready, Set, Go, and I'll follow on with John just a little bit there. As he, as he was very uh, clear, Ready, Set, Go is the purview of the Sheriff's Department or the local PD, if, if that is the applicable process. In your case, it's the Sheriff's Department. County Emergency Management, my office, maintains RAVE, the emergency notification system that has been spoken of here a couple of times tonight. And I, I would just reiterate, if we can get your citizens to sign up, I can assure them that the sign up A is free. It is very easy. It only takes a few minutes. Um, I and my staff manage that system very, very carefully. I can absolutely assure your residents their information will not be shared for any reason. We are very careful about the messages we send. We send at the direction of the Sheriff's Department. We send at request of a fire department, but we're very careful. We don't send, hey, there's a barbecue, you know, next Saturday in Munns Park. We don't send those types of messages. If you get a message from us, it's something you should pay attention to because it is about your safety. The system allows us to target geographically an area so if the Sheriff's Department says we need to evacuate Munns Park from Street A to Street B and Street C to Street D, we can target that specific area and notify the residents that are in that area who have signed up for the system. So please, please, please sign up for that. Uh, that's available at the county website, uh, coconino.az.gov forward slash ready, and on the emergency management page on the Coconino County website. So very easy to get to. And then That's lastly, right. Len, we built uh, this year, we built a fire restrictions page. This is a one-stop shop. We're trying to add some mapping. It's a one-stop shop for the fire restrictions that are in effect in the county. Um, as has been said here several times, we are doing a great job of coordinating. The county is in close contact with the forest, Coconino and Kaibab, with Arizona um, Department of Forest and Fire Management, BLM, National Parks. We all coordinate every Monday at one o'clock. We have a phone call and we coordinate. The new fire restrictions page, which is also on the Cook Community County EM webpage, is a one stop. It tells you what stage we're in. There's a link to the ordinance that tells you what's allowed and what's not allowed. Really, really a good source of information. It's brand new. We just launched it about a week ago. We're still making some little fine tweaks, but it's available and ready to go. So, Len, that's all I have, sir, unless there are questions. Well, thanks, Wes. Very good. I just want to reiterate something I believe John Paxson touched on. If you if you initially register, put in your phone numbers and email the very with the very first system we have. It's either code red or ready you know, I forget which. Code red, yes. But, but because this is our third software platform, some of the data got lost. So don't be complacent. If you put it in five years ago, put it in again just to make sure it's correct. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely good advice. Yes, sir. All right, Matt Ryan, take us out of here, uh, Matt, okay? Yeah. All right, Wes, uh, thank you uh, for having me again. And uh, just a note, a uh, little bit uh, quick introduction. Greg's out there. Greg, you want to hop on real quick? Here? Hi, thanks. Hi, yeah. thanks, Matt. My name is Gregory Nelson. I serve as Matt Ryan's district director. Um, so if you want to get reach out to us about anything, feel free to email me at gnelson at coconino.az.gov or call me at 928-679. 7163. Thanks for the opportunity and look forward to hearing from you. And Greg did follow up on that uh, uh, question associated with contacting our office. It went through uh, uh, another indirect process, didn't come directly to us, but was referred out to uh, uh, the sheriff's office uh, when we got the complaint associated uh, uh, that, that had been uh, asked about. Uh, that had been referred to our office. Um, just uh, uh, quickly, you know, Greg's 
uh, a dynamo. He's out there. He's answering a lot of our questions. He and I are always in contact and talk to each other. And uh, uh, and he just got a long needed vacation. So he's back and joining me again. Uh, just quick note of, as you see, the lineup that you have tonight, uh, there is a great partnership amongst the county, amongst the Forest Service, uh, fire department, uh, or fire district, I should say, uh, uh, weather service. Uh, everybody's dependent upon Brian uh, out there when we we do have events and we're constantly watching conditions. Uh, and, and I'm probably forgetting somebody, emergency management. Uh, so all our departments, uh, sheriff's office, everything they do, our officers all the way through, they're, they're uh, uh, volunteers that they work together with the community. We're all trying to work together on behalf of the community. Uh, uh, all of us have limited resources uh, and we have many challenges and we're, uh, we work together and try and address them. Um, I uh, have to admit, I've uh, to some degree neglected uh, uh, all of District 3, not just Mines Park. I've been uh, appointed as chairman of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, we have a brand new Board of Supervisors with three, three new members uh, on a learning curve, uh, have good hearts trying to do the right thing, uh, but, but we're working on that. COVID has taken enormous amount of time uh, for everybody uh, on what to do, where to go. Uh, thankfully, we're getting vaccinations uh, uh, going along, still encourage it. Uh, I worked in a biotech industry. It's a smart thing to do, folks. Get vaccinated. Um, the uh, we we had to replace our school uh, superintendent. Have uh, uh, Cheryl Mangum Pageant that had worked in the office for uh, ten years. Very good professional. That's in that position. Uh, had to replace Liz Archuleta, longtime board member. Uh, Geronimo Vasquez. We appointed. A uh, very dynamic young man working very hard. Uh, we'll miss Liz uh, with all her experience, uh, but she's moved on to uh, other federal programs and can help now and again, we hope, uh, with different issues. Uh, we had to go through a transition of a county manager and uh, uh, recruit a county manager. And as noted earlier uh, by, I believe, Mark, it was uh, uh, saying Steve Peru, long time. He worked for us for 30 years was county manager in interim capacity twice, uh, and then served as manager for six years. Just a wonderful thing to have somebody step in with the knowledge that we need at this time, uh, which is so important. We've had big land planning issues. Uh, uh, we're working on legislation constantly with the legislature. Uh, we have the federal American Rescue Plan, a lot of uh, uh, policy work, uh, and advocacy that we do both at the federal and state level. Uh, so a lot of, lot of big issues, but, but our various departments are out there working hard uh, to attempt to address issues. And then the last piece that we just worked through, we went through uh, two weeks of uh, budget hearings and budgets are pretty challenging this year. Uh, uh, not high performance, but better than what we anticipated, uh, uh, which is good. It keeps us in a, a, a stable uh, area. And then there's a proposal of getting federal funds. We don't know how they will come, what the guidance is associated with the federal funds. So we're looking at them for potential applications. An example would be uh, there are some funds that could be used for uh, emergencies. There are other funds that could be used for uh, potentially uh, uh, for forest restoration. So we're trying to keep an eye on guidance, see how we would work together with our partners and what to do. Uh, but until we get the guidance, uh, it's kind of hard to set a, ba a budget, let alone set, uh, move forward in the programs. The most important piece is that we're all trying to work together and, and bring resources there. Uh, one thing that we did do, uh, and I know it's always a need that we have uh, out there, is uh, we have a proposal for two new deputies in the sheriff's uh, office. Uh, hope was to get to six. Uh, uh, we've struggled with uh, bringing... Uh, full-time equivalents uh, personnel uh, into the county because we're also trying to address the cost of living and, and compensation. Uh, just uh, we have a housing crisis that's going on. The median price for a house five years ago was $350,000. That would be an income of $90,000 to be able to uh, uh, 
if you step into an ownership of a house like that, the medium now is uh, between five hundred and six hundred thousand uh, uh, dollars. Our workforce uh, is struggling to find uh, houses and be able to live within our communities. Uh, so it's it's a very uh, big challenge uh, that we have, uh, and so uh, uh, we'll continue to wrestle with that. Uh, the solid waste piece. Uh, it's we tried everything we could. We kept Willard Springs even uh, open even longer than the five years that Esler had mentioned uh, with a couple different advisory committees. Uh, our, our policy has been until private sector is there, uh, we, we will provide transfer service. Private sector has been available for a number of years. The community came to us. We worked with committees. We kept it open for uh, uh, well over uh, 10 years. Uh, I'm not even remembering how long. It's uh, probably more like 15 uh, that we were able to keep it a uh, keep it alive. But we are transitioning the money that we would have available for that. Uh, people now have to get private sector service uh, uh, subscriptions. There are about four different trash services in the area, uh, so it's it's by subscription that you have. Uh, we're a county. We cannot have services like a city can. Uh, it's private sector. And we lost that to the uh, solid waste lobby. We tried to lobby for service areas uh, for about eight years and we were never successful in getting that. And that's that's how it's set up by statute on what we can do and what we can't do. Uh, and, and we tried to have it so it was solvent. Uh, it didn't get there, but uh, public health and safety, uh, wildfire risk, uh, so important as you heard from everybody and we always go over uh, that we want to keep that green waste site open uh, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, not a cost associated with it. So uh, we've been able to do that during the COVID crisis uh, and we're hoping to try and do that in the future. We haven't had a full uh, board decision on that, but uh, I, I believe we have a board that that uh, probably would support that. I certainly would. Uh, you know, we once upon a time, we didn't have the burn pit out there. We brought that idea from Forest Lakes and uh, brought it in. The voucher system, uh, I know everybody participates in it. Uh, make sure you use them, help your neighbors, uh, clean up their property. There might be elderly folk that uh, can't do it. Just help them out. That that would be really good. Uh, I compliment the Forest Service in transitioning into uh, doing burns on the WUI. That's the area that we have greatest threat for our community. Uh, uh, kudos to the Forest Service. on uh, they, they were doing broadcast burns that, that are needed in rural uh, sections. It's always challenging because there's a potential threat to the community uh, and yet they, they put the resources there and they're working on that. Uh, so if that continues, that, that would be really, uh, really good. Uh, other pressures that we have and that all of you see uh, is uh, we're a popular place. Uh, we have a tax base of 140,000 people and some visitation that helps out, uh, but we have a Metro level of visitation and during COVID, oh my gosh, uh, people are everywhere, whether it's uh, the razors out there, hopefully they're responsible, but not everybody is, uh, or it's uh, uh, trash uh, uh, out in our public lands. Uh, uh, we're all struggling with how to address that issue and trying to work as a, a partnership with that. Uh, so uh, housing crisis, visitation, COVID, let's get vaccinations. Reduce the fire danger, do some thinning, make it firewise on your property, use uh, the Willard Springs sites, uh, and really appreciate uh, all the cooperation we always have with the community. If you can encourage your neighbors to also step in and help out, you can see we have professionals distributed, whether within the county or through our partnership, that are working on behalf of your community. Uh, thank you, Len. Thank you, Matt. Um... Our next meeting will be uh, August 18th, and it's going to be completely up to Chief Tope, whether we are able to use the fire station or do another Zoom presentation. Thank you all my panelists and all the people who have uh, clicked in. Um, if anyone has any last minute questions, you have 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, uh, Len, I'm, I'll respond uh, in terms of uh, land planning issues. Uh, I understand that there's been a public meeting uh, for a proposal east of the highway. That still is not an application 
within the community development department. In terms of uh, positions of the board, uh, I, it, it's a hearing, it's a public hearing where we have to, where we provide a neutral uh, opportunity for people that are for and against uh, proposals. Uh, my encouragement to people if they participate is uh, focus, focus on findings of fact, uh, uh, no matter what your position is associated with it. Uh, we cannot uh, legally uh, take a, a predetermined uh, position associated with it, and, and it's so that we can provide uh, uh, fairness for a hearing. It's a public hearing, it's, uh, uh, so that's important for uh, people to be aware of uh, on that. Thank you, Matt. All right. Ms. Lehman has another question. We're all done for this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Len. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. <clears throat>